To all the participants joining us from all around the world, we would like to wish you a warm welcome to the 2023 Annual Meeting for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. My name is Hani Mansurian, and I'm one of the coordinators of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, hired by UNICEF, and I'm joined by my fellow coordinator, Camilla Jones, who is seconded by World Vision. Hello everyone and welcome again. It's fantastic to see so many of you joining us today. We're proud to say that we have a record number of people taking an interest in this year's meeting, either as session organisers or as participants. We've more than doubled our numbers from last year. And this includes a number of fantastic child and youth speakers and facilitators. We'd like to extend our thanks to Ted Izom and World Vision for coordinating their participation. And this speaks to our ongoing commitment to ensure the meaningful participation of children in humanitarian action. And this year, we have the opportunity to welcome two groups of local and national actors from Iraq and, and Nigeria as part of our pilot project for participation hubs. I, I, I just saw the Iraq hub um, on camera. Um, welcome to you guys. And hopefully the Nigeria hub is also connected. They're gathered together in person um, so we are a bit jealous of that, uh, to participate in this year's meeting. To help us learn more about who is joining today, uh, please complete a Mentimeter that we're going to put in the chat uh, that will tell us where you are in the world, which sector you mainly work in, and which kind of organization you work for. Uh, we'll be using Zoom polls and Mentimeters um, throughout this year's session, so good to get used to all of those. You can either use it on your browser, or if you have a second device like a phone, a smartphone, you can use it there. Um, you just need to click on the link uh, that you can find in the chat box now uh, that my colleagues are putting in. Today, right after the opening session, we will take a look at the history and evolution of the child protection in humanitarian action sector. This is the first time, to our knowledge, that the evolution of our sector has been collated and documented in one place. In our penultimate annual meeting, so the one before last, together we launched our 2021 to 2025 strategy, a clarion call. We're now midway through the strategy period, or almost, and looking uh, to you to join us in putting this clarion call, this call to action, into action. In preparation for this year's meeting, we consulted our members on the focus of the meeting. The overwhelming majority wanted to unpack our strategic goal of the centrality of children and their protection. So during our session, our second session today, we'll further explore this concept, the centrality of children and their protection, which was introduced for the first time in our strategy. And as many of you know, last week, the Norwegian government, in collaboration with Save the Children, ICRC, and UNICEF, organized a global conference on protection of children in armed conflict. Our third session of the day today will be a reflection on this important confer conference. As you know, today also coincides with the World Day Against Child Labor. We wanted to seize this opportunity to celebrate the resilience of millions of children engaged in labor around the world. So our last session of today, ahead of some informal networking, has been brought together by the Child Labor Task Force of the Alliance, which is called by PLAN and, and ILO, as well as our children associated with armed forces and groups, or CAFAG Task Force. We extend our gratitude to them and the many individuals that have worked to bring this, this uh, commemoration together. In this year's meeting, our members also showed a strong interest in exploring further our strategic priorities of accountability and prevention, as well as the special attention we're giving in this strategic period to learning and development as an enabling factor for achieving the strategy. You'll see these areas of focus throughout the week's sessions and infographics. A record number of nearly 90 people or groups apply to present at this year's meeting. We'd like to thank those who gave their time to helping us select the sessions and shaping our exciting agenda. We invited over th one third of those who applied to present in either the knowledge and practice sessions or to convene and facilitate a longer session that's advocacy focused or will engage participants in strategic discussions. 
So before we move on, we wanted to take a look at the results of the mentee to see who we have in the room. I know Cheng uh, did a great job of warming you all up and asking you to share these things in the chat box. But one of the things we wanted to find out from the mentee poll is who we've got from specific regions around the world. We know we have stronger membership and sort of following in some regions than others. So let's take a look what we've got here today. I think I've minimized my screen, so it's looking really, really small, but I can see a huge number from Europe as expected. Also the Middle East and North Africa and um, other parts of Africa, but also some joining from other parts of the world, which is fantastic to see. We also um, asked about uh, the kinds of organization we have joining us today. Do we have international organizations, local organizations? And we also asked about the sectors that you're working in, because um, we have a strong focus on working across sectors in our strategy. And so we wanted to really see, are we, are we reaching those groups? If not, get promoting to your sector colleagues over the next few days. So maybe we can move on to the next slide of the Menti results, if it's possible. Uh, so the region that you're based in, again, it's really, really small, um, but that's the French, yeah. Which sector are you working in? There we go. Okay, I'll just make this a bit bigger. So overwhelming majority child protection, lots from education, our sister sector, um, but also protection. And then we've got a good number from food security, health, nutrition, wash, shelter and camp management. So welcome to you all. And I think that is it. Oh no, the, the kind of organization. Can we flick through to that result as well? To the producers, I know you're very busy. Um, okay, so a lot of international NGOs followed by national NGOs. Some have also described themselves as local NGOs, great number of UN agency reps as well, and also a few networks, independents and researchers. Fabulous, okay. Um, and of course, a warm welcome again to our participation hubs in Nigeria and Iraq. Back to you, Honey. Oh, Honey, you're on mute. Great, sorry. Um, so now we would like to extend our enormous gratitude to the team of facilitators from across the Alliance who, who have been working on developing interactive sessions over the past few months. During this year's meeting, we will also hear from all of our working groups, task forces, and initiatives about the work that they're doing. These groups provide technical support for the sector and are open for all to join and to engage in. So have a think about how they might be relevant to you. Our dear producers will kindly post the link to our website in the chat for you to find out more about these groups. You can also join the working group task force and initiative sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday to become more familiar with their work and join them if you are not already a member. We'd also like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our steering committee and our broader community who've supported and funded the organization of this meeting. In particular, we'd like to thank UNICEF, the US Bureau of Population and Migration, World Vision, International Rescue Committee, Terre des Hommes, Child Fund Alliance and War Child UK. Many of these contributions were to fund the interpretation and other tools that we're using, which we hope will make the meeting accessible to a whole range of participants. Um, I think you've already been explained how to access the interpretation and the translated captions, so those will be put in the chat box again in case you haven't been able. Um, but finally, for visual learners and those with diverse language needs, we have an artist creating a live drawing of many of the sessions this week. And you can see Alex is drawing um, pins uh, today, I believe, if not uh, scroll down and you'll find him and you'll see his drawing evolve over the course of today's session. If you're unable to join any sessions due to time zone or, or other reasons or other priorities you have, all the sessions will be recorded and available on our Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn channels after the meetings. Uh, you can see the channels on which the sessions are live streamed by clicking into the session on the Zoom event platform where you first came in from and looking at the banner at the top. So it will tell you where it's being uh, live streamed. To help you to also get some of the benefits you might have gotten if we were meeting in person, we have set up a number of networking and infographic sessions during the break times that our colleague Acheng just spoke to. We hope you enjoy exploring the virtual venue.
Okay, so we hope this week will be packed with opportunities for you to share and reflect, also to network and prepare to take action. We hope that you'll enjoy engaging in the range of sessions, showcasing initiatives from around the world and facilitated by quite a range of entities as well, while as much as possible staying away from your day-to-day -day work. It's always worth trying, isn't it? Okay, so we'd love it if you'd now join us in sharing one more thing in the chat box. We'd like you to write it down, but not hit enter until I say so. This way, everyone's contribution will come all at once. Although, to be honest, with so many participants, that kind of happens anyway. So please type your answer in, but don't hit send until I give a countdown. So we would like you to share one word or a short sentence that describes your hopes and expectations for the annual meeting. Okay, so I'll give you a minute to just think what that might be. Uh, maybe you have more than one, and that's also fine. So have a go, type it up, and I'm gonna count down. So we'll give it a three, two, one, and please hit enter. Lovely. We'll have a look at those as the day goes on. Back to you, Hannah. Fantastic, seeing a lot of encouraging and exciting uh, expectations coming up uh, with inspirational learning, um, networking, uh, challenge, challenging, so really exciting. Um, now, we would like to move into the opening session to kickstart the week. We're honored to welcome a World Vision Senior Director of Technical Resources Global Disaster Management Team, Mr. Daniel Wanganga. Daniel, over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you, honey, and uh, greetings, everybody. A very warm welcome to the 2023 annual meeting for child protection in Material and Action. What vision is a proud uh, colleague of the Alliance during this exciting period, a period with a strategy that outlines such a strong call to action for the whole humanitarian system to step up to their collective and individual responsibilities of protecting children. Protecting children is everybody's business. And I think this should be a sort of like a mantra as, as we move on. On one hand, we must acknowledge the highly specialized nature of child protection in that one, it requires knowledge and skills for working with children in all their diversity from infants to adolescents and children of all abilities and identities. Two, it also requires foresight and courage to identify and address abuse, exploitation, neglect, and violence. It requires, three, it requires an appreciation for the diverse contextual and cultural background where these children come from. On the other hand, we must continue to support and clarify the unique roles and responsibilities of all actors have across the material system, which is to ensure children and their protection is prioritized and central to the humanitarian action. And one way of doing this is that uh, number one is the Alliance is today using its influencing position to support and encourage a range of humanitarian actors to put children at the center of the humanitarian decision making and action. Two, while strong networking skills to do this are required, we should equally ensure that our organizations and structures are fit for purpose to keep children at the center of our responses. In this year's meeting, you will see a focus on prevention and accountability to children in particular, which are the two of the four priorities in the Alliance strategy. I would like to take a moment to share with you some of my reflections today. One, through this Alliance strategy, the child protection sector has said that it stands ready to support the wider humanitarian system to effectively engage children throughout the program cycle. And that is very important. And secondly, we expect that the system will be in a far greater shape in years to come as a result of these actions. We also expect we will be have a dedicated accountability mechanisms designed 
to make our organizations to account by children themselves. Thirdly, I'm encouraged to see such a high level of child and youth participation in this meeting. This is proof that you can move from token tokenistic approaches to actual partnerships with children affected by crisis. This year, we're also excited to see so many actors, as has been said already, and representatives from across a variety of humanitarian sectors actively engaged in these meeting sessions. Children, as you know, do not live lives divided by sectors and their protection should be the unifying lens through which we look at their well-being. Let me now close by stating our commitment as World Vision to support all the efforts of the Alliance to make the centrality of children and their protection everyone's business. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, I won't even try to, uh, to summarize that because that last point that you made, um, making centrality of children and their protection the, the business of everyone really, really wrapped it up very nicely. Thank you so much for being here with us and helping us open this exciting event. Um, now I would like to turn to Tasha Gill, who is the acting director for child protection in UNICEF at, at headquarters. Over to you, Tasha. Thank you, Hani. Um, and thank you, Daniel, also for those words. I've been reflecting as well on the last year since our annual meeting and thinking about how much climate change and conflict have shaped millions of children's of lives for the worse in this past year. Thinking about the flooding, the storms, the droughts, war, conflict of all types, and other forms of violence that have negatively impacted children. Thinking about the humanitarian situation for children and their families and communities. Over 339 million people are expected to need humanitarian assistance this year, 2023, and that's up from 274 million last year. 103 million people displaced, a million at risk of starvation this year. And I'm talking about all of the numbers, not just children, because I do think it's so important that we consider what it means for children when entire households and communities need humanitarian assistance and depend on it. All of this means that it's been a very tough and demanding year for the frontline responders, for many of you and the entire sector who've been striving to adapt and innovate, all of us together, to prevent and respond to these types of child protection needs. And that demand continues to grow. And so this meeting is for all of you. It's for all of us to step back, to exchange, to appreciate and to reflect. And I've been thinking about how this meeting has evolved over the years as well, from a small gathering to an inclusive event that now expects over a thousand participants from 130 countries. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank the organizers, the coordinators, the presenters, the Alliance, the entire network of all of you and others who will be joining us during this week and what you bring to the Alliance and what you've made it and how it's grown. I'd like to build on what Daniel has outlined as well in terms of the call to action and the strategy of the Alliance. Um, thinking back to how the strategy was developed, which was an exercise in listening to all of you and many others, um, the stakeholders within and outside the sector of child protection humanitarian action. But then also that the strategic priorities that are highlighted, advanced by the uh, strategy have emerged to already be sources of change across the sector. I wanted to speak to a number of those examples. Perhaps I'll just highlight prevention. And as you know, primary prevention is one of the areas that the Alliance has been promoting for years. Um, however, um, we can now see how it has already shifted the discourse within the sector. International and national organizations, UN agencies, UN offices, donors, have been systematically incorporating more and more primary prevention in their work, in their advocacy, in their analysis. This includes UNICEF, whom I'm re representing today and every day. We've even started seeing an increasing number of references to prevention in the humanitarian needs overviews and the humanitarian response plans. 
And that's a critical benchmark measurement of that shift, highlighting the way that the work that all of you do and the alliance and the strategy is impacting how we as a collective go about our life-saving work of protecting children. So I'm looking forward to this work, uh, to this entire week, as well as this work. I'm looking forward to the sessions that are planned for today as well. Um, the timeline of the evolution that Hani mentioned for our sector. Um, also looking forward to the rest of the discussions. I'll stop perhaps close by just emphasizing how I believe in the Alliance as a network is more than a sum of its parts. I'm very proud that UNICEF is co-leading the Alliance with World Vision International and delighted to continue to be part of this rich and diverse community. Thank you all for being here today, for joining us throughout the week and looking forward to the discussions and the exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasha, for those um, very positive and encouraging words to kick us off for the week, um, particularly that element of using this opportunity to reflect and, and think about what we have been doing for children and what we can do better for children, uh, learn from each other and, and really use this opportunity for, for growth, both personal and as a sector. Um, with that, I would like to move us swiftly along into, into the second part of the first session, which is the timeline. And I will hand over to Katie Robertson, who uh, is the co-lead of our Learning and Development Working Group, um, seconded by Plan International, to kick us off for that session. Thank you, honey. Um, and hello, everybody. It's great to see so many people already involved in the meeting from the very first session. Um, I'm very happy to introduce a short video on the evolution of the CPHA sector. The video summarizes the content of a new resource which you can find on the Alliance website now um, that offers a narrative of some of the events which have contributed to the shaping of our sector. While it's not an exhaustive list of all of the events and efforts that have been made for the protection of children in humanitarian contexts, we hope that the timeline will help practitioners to better situate where the sector has come from and to understand how this technical area of work has evolved. And just before we watch the video, um, we would like to thank all of those who've been involved in the development of the um, of the narrative document and of the video uh, so much for their help. But Julie, if you um, if you're ready, it'd be great to watch the video. Concern or disregard for vulnerable children in crisis situations is as old as humankind. How individuals, communities, and groups responded to the needs of vulnerable children and those in humanitarian contexts has varied over the long past based on beliefs, values, and behaviors at that time and context. Efforts to protect children in crisis over the past century and beyond have shaped the professionalization of the child protection and humanitarian action sector. In 1924, at the League of Nations Convention in Geneva, Eglantine Jeb, one of the two co-founders of Save the Children in 1919, presented the Declaration of the Rights of the Child to leaders from around the world, stressing the need to remember forgotten children. The child that is hungry must be fed. The child that is sick must be nursed. The child that is backward must be helped. The delinquent child must be reclaimed and the orphan and the waif must be sheltered and succored. The declaration was adopted by the League of Nations a year later, and an extended form was adopted by the United Nations in 1959. In the aftermath of World War II, the best interest principle was used in decision-making processes for the placement of children who were identified as kidnapped or adopted. The 1960s were essentially free of large-scale emergencies, and agencies reshaped their efforts to address longer-term needs. Emphasis on humanitarian action was reignited by the Nigerian Civil War, Nigerian Biafran War, and the Bangladesh War of Independence, immediately followed by large-scale famine in Ethiopia. Some of the first initiatives run by UN agencies and NGOs in the realm that would become child protection and humanitarian action were focused on unaccompanied and separated children 
and children associated with armed forces and groups, which was then referred to as child soldiers. Early programming in these areas was put in place during and in the aftermath of several wars, the Vietnam War, the Cambodian Civil War, the war between Cambodia and Vietnam, the First Liberian Civil War, the Rwandan War and Genocide, and the Sierra Leone Civil War, as well as in neighboring countries' refugee responses. With increasing recognition that ongoing routine services were not meeting the needs of many groups of vulnerable children, the program concept of children in especially difficult circumstances was adopted by UNICEF. In 1989, world leaders made a historic commitment to the world's children by adopting the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Contained in this treaty is a profound idea. Children are not just possessions of their parents for whom decisions are made, or adults in training. Rather, they are human beings and individuals with their own rights. It was shortly followed in 1990 by the African Charter on the Right and Welfare of the Child. Close interagency collaboration in the 1990s led to the reunification of tens of thousands of Rwandan children with their families in the aftermath of the crisis in the Great Lakes region of Africa. It is against this backdrop that the Interagency Working Group on Unaccompanied and Separated Children was set up in 1995. It brought together key organizations with field experience on issues concerning separated children. This is the first known example of organized and long-lasting interagency collaboration within the child protection sector. In 1996, Grasa Michelle report, The Impact of Armed Conflict on Children, highlighted the disproportionate impact of war on children. In 1998, the Security Council held its first debate on children and armed conflict and this led, in 2000, to the first ever report on children and armed conflict to the Security Council. Through the late 1990s and early 2000s, the need for contextually appropriate family and community-based approaches to reintegrate abused and exploited children became increasingly apparent, as did the need for prevention and preparedness techniques to protect children from harm before it occurs in the aftermath of a disaster. In 2005, the cluster system was introduced to address the lack of coordination between UN agencies, the Red Cross Red Crescent movements, and NGOs, and subsequently, the Child Protection Working Group was established in 2007 to support coordination of child protection responses in humanitarian settings. It's also around 2007 that a common definition for child protection in emergencies started appearing in reports and documents from more agencies. Child protection in emergencies refers to all efforts to prevent and respond to abuse, neglect, exploitation, and violence against children in the aftermath of a disaster. In 2012, the first minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action were released, and the definition for child protection in emergencies was codified in this document for the sector. Increased collaboration and coordination across humanitarian agencies led to production of several interagency technical products, as well as joint efforts to strengthen the capacity of the sector, advocate on behalf of children and their protection, and build stronger evidence for CPHA programming. In 2016, the Global Child Protection Working Group was split into the Child Protection Area of Responsibility and the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. The Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action launched a revised version of the Minimum Standards for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action in 2019. This video yeah. provides only a brief overview of the evolution of our sector more details can be found in the accompanying document, and the journey of the child protection and humanitarian action sector continues. As the sector evolves, it needs to find new ways of working rooted in the sharing of capacity, expertise, opportunity, and the intentional shift of power and resources to community, local, and national actors, while never neglecting the agency of children and the role of caregivers and communities in protection of children affected by conflict and crises. Great.
thank you very much, Katie, for um, showing us that video that you actually pulled together. Um, yeah, a, a lot to talk about. Uh, I'll just suffice to, to refer back to that really profound um, proclamation by Eglantine Jeb and that profound idea that was mentioned as, as being kind of the backbone of, this, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child that says children are not possessions of their parents, but rather rights holders and, and entities with agency, and they should be recognized as such. With that, um, we would like to uh, basically have a little discussion about, um, about our sector with uh, a few individuals who have been part of the evolution of this sector for, for many decades. Um, and having been part of it myself for, for about a couple of decades when I was watching this, it just made me really proud. Uh, I can't even imagine for those who have been part of this longer and those that came before us who actually prepared the ground for, for a lot of us to, um, to join and, and help evolve this sector into what it is today. So I would like to uh, introduce to you our, our panel, um, which, is, which consists of Alison Sutton, a human rights practitioner. Um, Alison used to be the, the global lead for child protection with Save the Children International as her last position. Then we're joined by Cornelius Williams, global expert on child protection. Uh, Cornelius was also uh, the global um, uh, child protection director for UNICEF. Uh, until recently, and Bill Forbes, Global Lead for Child Protection and Participation for, for World Vision International. Uh, welcome to the, to the panel, all three of you. So I will start by asking a few questions um, to you guys, um, and, I'll, and I'll mention who, who I'm asking the question to, and I would appreciate if you can keep your responses brief um, just for us to be able to catch up with time. We are a few minutes late, unfortunately, already. Um, Alison, I'll start with you. I wanted to know for you, what was the most pivotal point in the evolution of the sector? Well, I think um, if we look back to the origins of child protection, child rights thinking, it is significant that this arose out of a situation of war and concern for the rights of children of the enemy. So Eglantine Jeb and Dorothy Buxton were British women's suffrage activists, and they began raising funds to alleviate what was sort of child starvation in Austria and Germany that resulted from an allied blockade uh, in the after aftermath of the First World War. And this was 1919, so it was also a time of global pandemic. Um, but that, that sense of, you know, that this is for everyone, this led to a strong emphasis on the universality of rights and therefore the drafting of the 1924 Declaration on the Rights of the Children uh, brings together um, both rights and humanitarian principles. And I think it's also important that these origins reflected on the, the importance of alliance and partnerships. So um, the newly created Save the Children Fund allied with the International Red Cross Movement to negotiate within the then League of Nations for the adoption of the 1924 Declaration. And so uh, those principles of universality and solidarity hold us strong and relevant today, despite the fact that we have populist attempts to demonize children associated with armed forces and armed groups, or children that are migrant and asylum seeking children. Um, and so we need to draw on those original origins um, and principles and be inspired and guided by them because they do still hold strong. Amazing, thank you, Alison. So universality and the solidarity elements that we need to keep reminding ourselves and bringing back into our work. Um, Bill, I would like to ask you the first, the same question. What what do you think were the most pivotal points in the evolution of the sector? Uh, it's a great question, honey. And uh, it's great to be on this panel together, Allison and Cornelius. I remember when we were the young people in the room quite a few years ago, uh, but really appreciate the chance to read this paper and, and contribute to it and look back. Uh, so many pivot points through the history. Um, one that really stood out to me and stands out to me is the shift from 
children in especially difficult circumstances or CEDC and it's curative or symptom orientation. Many of us remember CEDC programs, the shift to the protective environment and systems thinking. And this of course led also to the strengthening of a prevention mindset, along with of course, continuing to support response services and supports. Um, this shift is still clearly reflected in areas like the Global Compact, as well as of course, the strategic objectives of the Alliance. Um, Part of this important shift was to recognize that this relates to humanitarian contexts, uh, as well as development contexts, where many people initially assumed that system strengthening was most relevant to development, and there was this unspoken assumption that humanita in humanitarian action, the sector should primarily focus on directly providing response services. And what was so what was such an important part of this shift was the recognition that even in fragile and humanitarian contexts, we could start with analyzing the actual protective environment around children. What is protecting them, even in a humanitarian situation, and even if it's only partial? And we could take a systems approach to strengthening that environment, working with both formal and non-formal actors. Two related areas of a child protection systems approach and a protective environment in humanitarian action, where we're also seeing progress in many humanitarian contexts, um, and where I'd like to see continued growth, and I'd like to see them uh, in the next chapter of this document down the road featured, are the contribution of non-formal actors, including faith actors, and of children themselves, as essential change makers, collaborators, and advocates. So indeed, accountability to children is one of the priorities of the Alliance strategy as well. So this shift from CEDC to a protective environment and systems approach, I think was a very important pivot where we do continue to grow and learn. Fantastic, thank you very much, Bill. Yes, the, the systems approach, which, which fortunately is still strong, um, both in humanitarian and developments, um, development settings, thanks to many of, of you guys. Um, Cornelius, I would like to turn to you and ask, uh, in your experience, what has been the biggest challenge in the child protection and humanitarian action sector? Thank you, Annie. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, loud and clear. Right. So, I mean, Bill has spoken about the pivot points, actually, right? Um, and I think that's important uh, because one of the things is to take your management with you, is to get management attention. As, as a practitioner, as we usually say, ensure that your management is supporting any initiative that you're taking forward because they're usually political and they're and sometimes very complex. Um, in the 90s, an example of it was in the 90s when the war was going on in Sierra Leone and raging in Liberia as well, to get the UNICEF head of office, the representative to prioritize the care and protection of unaccompanied and separated children was quite a challenge. In those days, you know, we focused on family tracing, reunification and the interim care. Remember in the nineties, that point earlier, as has been shown by the document, documentary, this was a war that took place after Cambodia, Vietnam, Rwanda and the Great Lakes, okay, where, the care and protection of an accompanied children was becoming standard intervention. It was like responding to malnutrition, food security, and what's on. But then we had to convince a representative that this was a priority. I want to point out that during that period, the leaders in care and protection of an accompanied children were UNHC and Save the Children, and I saw the mention of the interagency guideline. Now, the challenge for child protection uh, practitioners is how do you convince your senior leadership to prioritize this issue, to invest in this issue? In the last decade, we've got better at it, understanding of this issue, but the practice keeps evolving and colleagues would need to get better at being ahead of the curve, as Bill has said, he has shown all the different things we have to articulate. And again, they are caught in HR protection and contextual issues. So for me, this is to me the biggest challenge that we continue to face and that I had faced actually in my career. And to round it all up, 
in the document, if you go back to the document, in the final pages, the documents say, we know that the protection of children was often overlooked in the global response to the pandemic. So it's still a challenge. Back to you. Thanks, Cornelius. Yes, I think that resonates with a lot of us, this issue of being able to not just because we, we constantly talk about donors, but not just with donors, also within our own organizations, our senior management, how do we convince them that this is equal uh, and equally important with, with all the other sectoral interventions? Alison, I want to come back to you and ask the same question. What do you think were, were the biggest challenges or have been the biggest challenges for the child protection and humanitarian action sector? Alison, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. So yeah, following on from Cornelius, I think it, the continue, it's been a continuous challenge in humanitarian context as achieving uh, acceptance that child protection is life-saving and not just a nice to have, and therefore merits prioritization of funds. And so the challenge is both the prioritization and the funding. Um, so in, in 2015, the Child Protection Working Group and the Child Fund Alliance did a, published a study on um, a matter of life and death, making the case. Um, and when I joined um, at the global level on the child protection side, it was very difficult to get a picture of what was happening uh, within and between responses as far as child protection was funding was concerned. Uh, so we, we set ourselves a challenge of following the money. And uh, Margaret Theory um, undertook a series of studies, first for Save the Children, and then on behalf of the whole of the Alliance um, and the UNHCR, deciphering the UN tracking system and the UNHCR system. And it showed that whilst child protection funding has increased over time to meet increased need, it is proportionately underfunded. And whilst overall humanitarian responses have a funding fulfillment rate about 68%, child protection, this is 29%, but that's not to mention the huge differences between responses and also from year to year. Um, and I think later on in the, in, the, in, in the meeting, you're gonna have the opportunity to hear um, uh, the latest update on the 2023 analysis of that um, funding situation. Um, I think another, a, a new opportunity and a challenge um, it has been the integration of child protection across different sectors. So it brings a potential access to funds, leverage, scale with health, education, um, and, and other, other sectors. Um, but it also brings a challenge of, sort of attribution and counting. And our colleagues in the uh, MHPSS sector have found the same um, with them coming out with a, a study on following the money, um, I think last year, um, in how to visualize uh, mental health and psychosocial uh, support activities and funding across sectors. The thing is that the multi-sector approach is what should, is the aim, is what we should have, but it's just, it just makes it harder to count. Um, and I think in terms of sort of a milestone, maybe uh, it was interesting and, you know, it showed, it encouraging to see in October 2020 um, when the classification of life saving for child protection was expanded um, and that making more activities um, eligible for SURF funding in initial responses. And so from the initial focus on unaccompanied and separated children, children associated with armed forces and armed groups and sexual violence, you get an expansion to include uh, as you know, high priority in the first phase, child protection case management, support for children at risk, com building community-based child protection mechanisms. Um, and so it would be interesting, particularly in the, in the discussion uh, later in the meeting about the current situation of funding, just to see whether that did trigger um, an increased attention to this area um, for, from, uh, response leaders as 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 um uh, Cornelius was saying you know how, how do we make sure that it is there and it gets the attention and um not just from managers within agencies but also at the response level fantastic thank you very much Alison so while you point out the the challenges but you also have mentioned some of the progress we have made uh, on that front in the in the past few years so thanks thanks for that uh both positive when you're talking about challenges 
message. Uh, Bill, I'll come back to you. Um, what do you think, what kind of lessons do you think the next generation of the child protection and human interaction practitioners can learn from the past? Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the key lessons that we can and we must learn and continue to learn really is the recognition that child protection is inherently complex and challenging. It's just so clear reading through this history. Child protection, and, and it's clear for any of us, for all of us, I think, when we think about it, child protection is not simple, standardized, linear work that can just be scaled and replicated easily, or even just adapted during the design phase and then implemented in a straightforward, predictable manner. It is complex work that requires ongoing adaptive engagement uh -huh. and management by our frontline staff. And really recognition of this complexity was part of what drove and shaped the change that I mentioned earlier around the shifting of the focus from serving individual children to a systems approach to strengthening the protective environment. That was also implicit in that or foundational to that was this recognition that it's complex work. And this recognition that child protection is complex is rooted in the principle that child protection work has to start with the children's own reality, their environment, rather than starting with our own external solutions. Of course, our external interventions will hopefully have an impact on the children's reality, but their reality is our starting point and our reality, really. I think we need to get comfortable with this complexity and we need to embrace it. There's a lot of pressure these days to simplify our approaches to straightforward solutions in ways that sometimes do not really actually set us up for impact, I think. Complexity is the reality, and it is also something that we can hold forth and promote and even, I think, build legitimacy around. Of course, we can recognize the need of some stakeholders for global data, aggregated data, for the and the global discourse on uh, evidence-based approaches and the and, and identifying from good practice, things like that. In that respect, we can tell concrete stories. We can identify and learn from good practice and have meaningful global measurements of some processes and changes. But even as we tailor our narratives and discourse to various audiences at different levels, let's honor the complexity of child protection that's reflected in this CPHA history and be careful that we we don't simplify the discourse in ways that do not recognize that reality or do not set up our teams and our partners for success. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, so in, in brief, complexity is the reality. We need to embrace it. But I really love that element of their, the reality of children is, is, is the starting point and has to be the starting point for our work, which doesn't help with the complexity. but. Um, Great, Cornelius, last question of this segment um, for you is, let's reflect on mistakes that early generations made and, the, and that the future humanitarian actors should learn from and be aware of. And so, because I made some of these mistakes myself, but one of the mistakes is the first thing is embrace the complexity that um, Bill is talking about, but use a systemic approach. And by saying use a systemic approach, okay, sometimes colleagues think it's cookie cutter, the same systems. But as he has said, you have to contextualize the system. You have to build the system up. You have to ensure that the community is part of the system. We have seen parallel um, structures and interventions being set up. I'm an ex-UNICEF. I'm also ex -safe. And I know how UNICEF loves um big bold initiatives right and what are we saying don't set up a parallel system i'm back in my country and i go to the ministry to say hello to people i worked with and you look back and wonder where is all the investment because parallel systems were the thing to do in the 90s right so we ask in where is all the investment and you were here, honey, and there was some skeleton of it left, but you had to virtually rebuild it again, right? But I can say that the systems can respond to complexity. I was recently in Afghanistan, just before I left UNICEF, and they were able to respond due to the system. In Ethiopia, they are doing the same. We've seen the resilience of the system in Zimbabwe year after year. And I was also actually in South Africa where 
the workers who were responding came from the child protection system. They were responding to victims um, who had suffered from extreme weather events, flooding, etc. So it is possible. We need to avoid this uh, uh, a, a cookie cutter approach to the systems. We need to ensure that the systems are delivering results for children. We need to ensure that the children are part of the process. Okay, so complexity, address the complexity, make sure that the systems are uh, um, bespoke and fit for that context. And you have already recognized it's the Alliance. It's part of the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action, principle nine. So what we need to see is that it's embraced by all practitioners. And again, as we keep saying, convince your management and take it forward. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, so contextual systems approach uh, to, to address the complexity. Uh, that Bill mentioned. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you guys, but just to warn you, we're running a bit uh, uh, behind time. So it would be great if you, if you prepare your next response, a bit shorter than we anticipated originally. With that, I'll, I'll quickly hand over to Elena to do a little bit of an exercise with the participants on, on the timeline and looking ahead. Elena, the co-lead of our Learning and Development Working Group. Thanks, Annie, and um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, yes, with Cornelius, Alison, and Bill, we have now reflected on uh, a bit on the past of the sector, and uh, the video will certainly help like, to reflect further on that, and so the CPHA uh, timeline document uh, that I hope you all get a chance to read soon. Uh, but we also want to actually look ahead like, and build a bit of a vision with you all. So we would like to think ahead like um, for the next 10 years and imagine it's 2033 uh, and we are watching the new CPHA timeline video. What would be the milestones, the key steps that you would have wanted the sectors to have taken in these next 10 years? What would you like to see in that video in 10 years from now? So I think our producers have already shared a Menti link in the chat and you can just uh, go ahead and include your thoughts. And I see um, that there are already suggestions coming through the chat. For example, Kristen is mentioning that children uh, should be on the Alliance Steering Committee. Uh, child protection is integrated alongside the other key sectors in emergency response. Primary prevention <laughs> becoming top priority. Um, all children have a safe environment to grow up in. That would be amazing. Um, Preparedness and anticipatory reaction integrating in child protection for climate change. Certainly, we're going to see lots of climate change work in the years ahead. Accountability to affected children is a reality. Engagement and involvement of children, consultation with various countries, family strengthening being prioritized. Why not? Maybe as part of uh, all of like the primary prevention interventions that we're gonna be putting in place in the next uh, um, few years. So, And I see that there are also other suggestions that are coming through the chat, but keep on adding like to this, um, uh, to this Mentimeter. I know we are running like a couple of minutes later, so I want to give that time back to speakers possibly. So maybe Annie, while we continue to receive the inputs from our audience, maybe we wanna give a, mi a minute or two back like to uh, you and the speakers that are with us on the show today. Thank you, Annie. Over. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Elena, for your kind offer back of some of the time. Uh, great. So we'll we'll dive right into it. And thanks for everyone contributing to this, helping us think about what needs to happen uh, in the next 10 years for our sector. So I want to ask the same question to uh, to our panelists. So Cornelius, what, what do you think should happen? What kind of shift would you like to see in the next 10 years and hopefully be reflected on the timeline when we revise it in 10 years? Sorry. Yeah. So in the next 10 years, if I'm reading this document, I want to see when the practitioners 
take the principle and the policy of prevention at the po population level to practice. I would like to read as you uh, wrote in the document how unaccompanied children was done in the Cambodia Vietnam border. Okay, I mean, and some of the things that has happened. We see prevention now. We see prevention at different levels. We've seen it at the community, we've seen it at the pro pro program level. We know about prevention of uh, family separation. We know about prevention, the recruitment and use of children by armed forces, recently mental health, but not at the population level. So how can we take the practice to the population level? And you already have a document, but we want the practice. The primary prevention framework is there. The TOC from UNICEF talks about it, but we want to see the practice. And how can we make the link to the communities and what actually Bill was talking about, the rights and, 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 and Alice in the rights and resilience of children and make sure that we, this can be seen as an investment that donors and governments can buy into. Fantastic. Thank you very much, much for that um, kind of re-emphasizing re of the importance of, of primary prevention. Hopefully we'll see it on the on the timeline soon. Bill, same question for you. What would you like to see on the timeline in 10 years? Well, Cornelius already said one thing for sure. Um, I'll just emphasize, I'd like to see a shifting from the mindset and practice of delivering external solutions for impact to instead utilizing evidence to equip and support authentic local engagement, building on the ecology of the child and local initiatives. Uh, this, of course, aligns with the st Alliance strategic priority on localization. Um, we need to be careful not to be aiming for or seeking to implement, as Cornelia said earlier, cookie cutter or blueprint approaches of scaling best practices or scaling solutions and what can really become a colonial mindset which basically implies to donors and to the public that outsiders can implement changes anywhere they want the same way for guaranteed outcomes. That sounds to me very much like colonial thinking, that solution way of presenting this concept. So we instead need to utilize evidence and best practice to support authentic local engagement and local transformation and local solutions, valuing and relying on community level work, children's voice and agency, and the dependence that we have on local actors for children to be safe, including local government, local services, such as teachers and community health workers, local civil society, faith leaders and communities, and parents and children themselves. This means that we can and we should bring, of course, the lessons and approaches that have had an impact in other places. Of course, we should do that, but we need to operate with a respect for the local context, local actors, local assets. And in, and in a way that adapts to emerging challenges, threats, and opportunities. So I think we need to ask ourselves, and I hope we see this in the 10-year uh, uh, history, what sort of international and national discourse, policies, and resources actually support this kind of shift? This sort of thoughtful, adaptive engagement is really one of the universal features of projects that I have worked in or visited that have generated transformative impact and even in humanitarian contexts. And I'd love to see this become the normal way that we frame our evidence building, our approaches and promises to donors, to the public, and most importantly, to children, caregivers, and communities. Thank you. Fantastic, Bill. Thank you very much for that emphasis on, on true localization. Um, not tokenistic, but really truly thinking about uh, contextual interventions and ownership of, of the work. Um, Alison, briefly, if you don't mind reflecting on the same uh, concept, and what would you like to see in 10 years? Well, I mean, just to say, it's just such a pleasure to be back here with these colleagues making such fantastic points. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, so in the next 10 years, I would like to see the centrality of protection in humanitarian action, and specifically the centrality of children and then protection within that, um, move from words to responsibilities and accountabilities. So in three, in three ways, one, that the protection of civilians, civilians from harm and most especially children becomes a performance indicator for senior management in the humanitarian sector with reporting on what they've done in both prevention and response and budget tracking. 
Um, I'd like to see that the principles and tenor of the Convention on the Rights of the Child are fully understood. Got an interruption. Um, understood, internalized, and pursued by all state, non-state, and civil society actors. And if you know the the the, the minimum standards on child protection in uh, humanitarian action could also be you know more widely taken up as well. Um, but then if we look at the accountability strand, um, I'd like to see that we start seeing real accountability for grave violations against children and that a number of properly funded specialized investigations lead to prosecutions <laughs> and convictions of perpetrators, commanders and leaders. And that these exemplary cases inject a kind of new potency into the international standards that such violations are always to be reported, never to be tolerated, and those responsible to be brought to justice. And so if we think that we're uh, only one year from the 100th anniversary of the 1924 Declaration on the Rights of the Child, you know, it cannot be that people are still only waking up to the idea of child rights, their implementation and enforcement. So my encouragement um, to the Alliance in this meeting is to take that uh, and also the clarion call that's the Alliance's five-year strategy forward, that you are the champions of this and you do it so well and that you run with it so that we can see those changes in ten years, within the next 10 years. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alison, for that really powerful call for accountability on all levels. I mean, you talked about holding the, the senior management and humanitarian uh, architecture accountable for, for centering children and their protection, but also in terms of prosecution and bringing child rights, really cent centering that uh, and around what, what we do. And as the Alliance, we, we will do what we can uh, to make sure that that happens. Thank you very much, all three of you, for, uh, for being with us uh, from three different corners of the world. For Bill, it was four o'clock in the morning and all the way to London and, and Freetown in Sierra Leone. Thank you very much. Um, I will hand over to Elena to quickly wrap us up and shift us over to the next session. <laughs>